My mom loved guns. She was an NRA member. She had a concealed weapons permit. She used to love going to the shooting range. She started going with her second husband. She even tried to get me to take a gun with me once to San Francisco <laughs> on a road trip. Like when I just graduated from college, it was pretty funny because I'm not into guns at all. With the first time that she had suicidal ideation a couple years ago, or actually it was more like um, a few years before she died, her, her husband took all the guns and he locked them up. He locked up all the extra meds. Uh, the day that she died, she had a really bad day. She was, she'd been depressed probably for a couple months. Um, she probably took some extra meds that day. She probably took a few extra Valium to take the edge off. She had a big fight with her husband and she went upstairs after that. She took the gun that was conveniently located close to her bed for personal protection. She put the gun in her mouth and she pulled the trigger. I think that she would have uh, been pretty pissed off <laughs> because she has three grandkids now. Uh, two, she never actually got the chance to meet and they would have loved her. She would have loved them. My mom wasn't a stranger to depression and I wish that she had made a different choice that summer to lock up her weapons. I wish that I had helped her lock them up. I would have never been able to get her to get rid of her guns but I probably could have helped her lock them up. Her husband could have helped her lock them up. The easy access to the firearm was the thing that really made the difference, I think, in that moment. And now she's gone. Uh, I lost a brother to suicide. And we grew up in a ranching community and had guns around us our whole lives. It was very normal. Um, I knew how to shoot a gun at the time. I was very young. And when my brother, who was one of those very charming, really handsome, really cool brothers, got very ill and got involved with substances, nobody thought it was odd. Nobody thought that, oh, we should not have his guns around or anything like that. We just thought he would handle his business. It was tough ranching culture. So when he went into rehabilitation in 1984, uh, we were all very surprised. I can remember being really surprised. I can actually remember going to his house a week before this happened and noticing that he had a lot of guns and being struck by how many guns he had, um, but not connecting that with that he was getting more depressed and certainly not seeing it coming that he might go into care. So the thing that happened that was interesting and that I think was so shocking to me after the fact was he came out of 30 days of rehab and no one had been notified of an aftercare plan. I did find this to be true. No one in our family had been contacted except that he's leaving, going home. And 30 days after he left the rehabilitation center, he shot himself with a deer rifle that he had in his home in his possession. I was so struck by the fact that not only was there not somebody in the family involved with him while he was in care, not, not just that they weren't involved while he was in care, but not afterwards, so there was no plan. So this was an incredible shock to our family. Um, and it was really a shock because he was the last person you might think would do this. So if there is something relevant to our endeavor with changing how we think about firearms and people's health, I would say, always see them as this vulnerability point. Um, see them as something that people should be thinking about, because honestly, there was not a single person in our family that thought this could be an issue. Um, I think one of the most compelling elements of this effort to help people's lives is recognizing that by the time I've either made that call to get help, somebody in my family has said, or the law has said, you need help. I'm in the throes of exposure. Everything at this point has been amplified. And whatever you thought was never gonna be on the menu for me to do, to try, to say, it's now on the menu. And that that simple dynamic gets lost, I think. That I may feel even initial relief, but that's not what sustains me. Because I'm now, it's all out in the open, and that's, for some of us, and clearly for us for my brother, it's such an awful, unsustainable 
level of experience that he made the choice to end that experience. He just could not take it. And when firearms are part of that potential menu item, there's no way to get in front of that impulsive, fast-acting, terrible termination. I'm David Grossman, I'm a pediatrician and I'm um, an investigator here at the Group Health Research Institute. Um, I've had a long-standing interest in prevention of youth suicide, um, primarily focused on uh, teenagers um, and uh, restricting their access to guns. I think many people know guns are the, really the leading cause of death for suicide in, in teenagers and adolescents and it seems that there's a way of there should be a way for us to be able to prevent kids from getting access to those guns. We've had a, a lot of different takes of this through my research and it, I think that we have demonstrated that for starters that locking your gun um, in a secured uh, safe or box reduces the risk of uh, firearm suicide by about 75% um, and that is a, a big number, uh, not perfect, but certainly good enough to be able to take forward with um, trying to see how we can improve um, parents' ability to store guns. Many people store guns for protection, uh, particularly um, handguns, and those are often the guns that are hardest for people to want to lock up. So what we learn from talking to um, gun owners, especially police, is that a lockbox, which is a small safe device like this, actually um, it can be a very effective way of um, providing homeowners with a rapid access to their gun if, uh, if they feel they need it for self-defense, um, but also restrict access to other people in the home um, through the use of the combination. And in this case, we're encouraging the use of a push-button type device, in part because um, then there's no key to have to worry about hiding or that someone may find. Another popular device that's been promoted is the trigger lock. Um, those can be used on both handguns and rifles. Um, that's an advantage. But the problem with trigger locks is that many gun owners see them as being hard to use. They're clumsy. Um, and because there are three pieces and two hands that have to put this all together um, with a gun in the middle. And then also because um, there's a key involved. And again, once again, you have to worry about hiding the key and putting it someplace. We actually took this idea to Alaska where we did a randomized controlled trial and we brought um, large safes actually into homes um, in small villages in Alaska to see if um, people actually would lock their guns up there. And this is a place where the average number of guns per family is somewhere around um, five to six. Most of them are rifles or long guns, hence a lockbox wouldn't be an appropriate strategy in that kind of environment. So we took a larger version of that into the villages and what we found was that um, prior to the start of the study, about 89% of homes in the villages had their guns, had one or more guns unlocked in the, in the home. At the end of the study, 18 months later, after several surprise visits to see how people were storing their guns, we found that um, only about 38% um, of homes actually had one or more guns unlocked, uh, which is a dramatic difference in change, um, leading us, giving us further optimism uh, that this is a behavior that's changeable.